everyone. I am James Milan. Welcome to this episode of Talk of the Town. I am joined today by a, an author who lives right here in Arlington, Sandra A. Miller, because I've been told there are many, many Sandra Miller writers, <laughs> um, has joined us. Um, and we want to talk today about her first novel, which she is in the final stages of the process of publishing. Um, and also her past, as a, you know, her, her work as a writer over the years. Um, and I'm just delighted to welcome you to our studio here at ACMI. Thanks Thank for, you, James. Great yeah. to be here. Thanks for being here. Um, you know, I have to say that our friend, our good friend, Tom Formicola, the head of the ACA of our Arlington Center for the Arts, uh, pointed you in our direction. Yeah. And so you reached out and said, hey, I have a book and, you know, maybe you might be interested. And I jumped all over that, as you probably remember. Um, and I'm grateful to Tom because I love to talk about books and I don't get enough chances to do so. So Wonderful. thanks for that as well. Um, having said that, I actually, I'm not going to start with the book. I'm going to start more by just asking you a little bit about yourself, your your history as a writer, your time in Arlington. Just tell us a little bit about you. All right, so I am a 25-year resident of Arlington. I moved here when I was pregnant with my son, my first child, and um, I've lived in East Arlington in a little house next to Magnolia Playground mm -hmm. for those years. And um, Great part of town. It's a great part of town, close to the T. You can mm -hmm. hop into Boston. So that's been my writer's haven for um, those decades that I've raised my children in that house. And um, while I was while I was raising my kids, um, I did all kinds of writing. I uh, I had a dream of being a novelist. I, as I was um, pregnant with my son, my first novel that I'd written in an MFA in writing program had just. Um, gotten an agent in New York, so mm -hmm. I thought, oh, wow. fantastic, right? So I'm going to have the baby, and I'm going to have the book. And what's going to happen is my husband's going to stand in the back of the room of bookstores holding our sleeping baby <laughs> while I present to the crowd, <laughs> That right? is wonderful. That, that, that was the dream, exactly. <laughs> right? Yep, and, yep. and guess what? 25 years later, I am publishing my first book, a different book. So, That's right. So and he no longer <laughs> can hold that baby no, in the same, in the same way. But I think you should go ahead and prop them up th there, your son and your husband, and see what you can do with that. That's yeah. funny. So what happened? What happened to derail that? Well, as I think most novelists will tell you, the path to publication is never straightforward. And that novel, it got some interest from New York editors, but Ultimately, it never landed a home. So um, I soon had another child, a daughter, and now I've got two children, and I didn't have the space to write uh, fiction mm -hmm. as I was raising my kids. I only realized that recently. When I was in it, I thought, I'm not disciplined enough. I'm not good right. enough. I don't have the story Why to tell. Why can't I find it? Why yeah. can't I do this? And I, so, of course, I beat myself up when, in fact, I think the issue was there just wasn't room in my head. So I turned to nonfiction and I ended up working for the Globe for years as a correspondent and writing essays for all kinds of publications, a lot of women's publications. I had a, um, one of my essays won a contest in Glamour magazine and it was turned into a short film starring Kerry Washington wow. as me and Sting's Is wife that right? yeah, was the director. Trudy Styler. Trudy Styler wow. was the director. And so I got to go to this premiere in New York That's and fantastic. be on the Today Show. So I had some really great successes in those years, but I didn't have the novel. I also began teaching writing at UMass Lowell, which I still do. So it took the pandemic, summer of 2020, remember nobody could go mm -hmm. anywhere, you couldn't do anything, no barbecues, no parties. We we're all stuck in our homes. And this novel that had seeded itself into my consciousness years earlier, um, came to be fully formed like a download. And wow. every morning of that summer of 2020, I wrote a thousand words. And by the end of the summer, I had completed Wednesdays at one, and it felt like a really complete, fully formed novel. I was really pleased with it. And so it really took the space, the quiet of the pandemic, and my children were being both in grown, college, yeah, being yeah. grown-ups, to yeah. really find the space and 
three years later, I'm about to publish it. Yeah, that, I mean, I want to talk about what happens over those three years, you yeah, know, especially yeah. when all of this flows out. But actually, I want to just, before, and again, yes, it is Wednesdays at 1, folks, okay? We are going to be talking about this at, at some length. But I do want to actually go back a little bit. And you were saying that for years and years, you worked for the Globe in different, right, you know, doing different kinds of articles. Yeah. I know from what you mentioned to me before we, we uh, went on air, I know that the, some of that brought you, some of that work for the Globe brought you right into the studio. Tell us a little bit about that. Your, it your did. previous connection with ACMI. Yeah, no, I, um, I found a connection to Steve Katzos, who of course did the Steve Katzos show here. I think 250 episodes. More than 250 right? episodes in community so. media, folks. That is crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and he was a great guy. And so I did a nice article for um, uh, Globe West uh, section, I believe it was, about Steve, his show, his background, what landed him here. And I got to see a couple of his shows, brought my kids to those shows. Oh, and that's great. We had a blast. So that was, yeah, that was several years back, and that was my first yeah. um, experience. Right now, I, right now, we are shooting in our studio, and we're tucked into the corner where the house band used to be, I believe, for Steve, the Steve Katzel show. Anyway, we got to turn the studio into a late-night variety show kind of space with a live audience and, you know, the couch for Steve, and Steve to talk to his guests and... Yeah and the bands and all that stuff. It was it was really a fun time, and I know yes. that you got to experience some of that energy that came oh, uh, yeah. as well from having a crew of 20 people who were, many of whom were professionals volunteering yeah. their time, et cetera. So yeah, it's yeah. really one of our great accomplishments here at ACMI, so yeah. I couldn't resist. No, of course not. I was gobsmacked when I came in, and my kids <laughs> loved it, and I think I brought them in a couple other times afterwards just to see the show because he had, of course, the live audience, and I think his dad was always there, like came to every show, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, it was it was a spectacle. It was fantastic. Well, yeah. uh, to get back to what you were saying about when you first, you know, when the, the idea of being a novelist, the the sense that maybe you could and would be a novelist, goes back to right right when you started motherhood as well yeah. um what like how about college etc did you come out of college and and you were intending to write and that's what you started doing right away yeah i went to college as a psychology major because um sometimes we come from dysfunctional families and we think oh if i become a psychology major i can i can fix this all <laughs> so that's what i did and i had um i took my first <laughs> literary How'd that go? uh no it didn't go well but that it would have been fine except my husband is a psychologist who's inspired this book which is about a psychologist mm. and so um, there's only we only really need one in the family <laughs> so so he um, me I um, I had a professor who handed back my first paper in a literary analysis class and she said you're a good writer you should be an English major and I thought that's all it takes okay one <laughs> really smart professor seeing you and um, and that was the course I took and I left college and I began to work in um, trade paperback publishing for NAL Penguin, mm -hmm. um, Viking Penguin. Mm -hmm. And I was an editorial assistant. I was later a literary agent out in Los Angeles. And, um, but really, after I left college, I wasn't as desperate to create a career as I was to escape. I'd lived what I felt was a somewhat sheltered life, mm -hmm. and so, after I'd worked in New York and LA, um, I landed a job in Tokyo. And so I ended wow. up teaching at um, a sister school of Oberlin University mm -hmm. in Tokyo for two years. I think I was 23, 24. And, um, and that led me to another adventure in Luxembourg. So I spent seven years of my 20s living out of the country. But in that time, um, that's really when I became a writer because in the quiet, of a culture where you can't necessarily understand the language mm -hmm. and you feel separate and other, um, it can drive you inside. It made me very internally focused and it really made me, allowed me to hear my own thoughts and be very self-reflective and thoughtful about things. And I just, I filled journals in those years and soon those journals turned into short stories and the sh or the essays or mm -hmm. um and that was when i really started to write when i was living out of the country and um yeah. everything was an adventure everything was worthy of exploring right. in my journals right and especially you're in your 20s uh there's yeah. a whole 
lot of a certain kind of growth that happens yeah. once you start in the world and you're yeah. no longer choosing who you can be around you know you're you're going to be you're going to have to figure out how to get along with the other people in, in your workplace or mm -hmm. whatever it is that mm -hmm. you're doing I just find that the way that we do things here in the United States, at least, is you know more or less all the way up through through twenty the age of twenty two, mm -hmm. you you got it pretty good in terms of you know who's paying the bills, probably mom and dad. Who's you, you know you you fall out with this friend, well, there's five other interesting people over right, there, right. Um, and the, that becomes very different once you start making your own way in the world in yeah. your twenties, and yeah. when you add to that. What you've already said which is yeah. taking yourself off unmooring yourself yeah, yeah. escaping i think you said yeah i know to go um, into the complete unknown mm -hmm. at 23 a country where i didn't know anybody i I had studied the language, you know, make, be taking a course in New York City. I think that's what I did to prepare. But I was really very ill-prepared for what was ahead. Mm -hmm. I had never taught before, and I was, I was there for three days before I had to teach my first class <laughs> to 40 Japanese students, a college-level class to 40 Japanese students. Wow. So it was trial by fire. Yeah. I made a whole lot of mistakes, um, but I learned, and I grew so much. It was just like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that and, and, and I also do understand and, and it makes a, a ton of sense that uh, you would develop even more of a writer's sensibility through that experience because yeah. as you said, you are isolated in a sense from this culture in which you are at the same time trying to immerse yourself mm -hmm. or it's certainly observing yeah. a whole lot of things that are different from anything you've seen before yeah. and you have yeah. to figure that out and process yeah. it. And if you're naturally a writer, yeah. what a great way to do that. Yeah. And, and think about those times. So that, those were the late 80s. And we had, uh, we had no internet. We, uh, phone calls cost a dollar oh, a minute ton. from Tokyo. Absolutely. Right? So 10 minutes to your friends in the States was, you yes. know, $10 it is you probably a didn't major have. Investment, right? Right? Major investment. Major and, investment. Um, and there were, there were no distractions. It was a really powerful experience to be that isolated. It was very, in many ways, very lonely. I did have friends there and my colleagues, my fellow teachers, but there was a lot of time spent in my Tokyo apartment with my books or my writing. Mm -hmm. And it was really fruitful to have no distractions at that time. Or you wrote a letter to somebody, those aerograms that took two mm -hmm. weeks to get to the Absolutely. person and two weeks back. So, so that experience of being not only immersed in the you know, immersed in the culture, but immersed in my own um, focus, solitude, silence, mm -hmm. um, was a gift that I don't honestly know if I'd become a writer today. I don't know if I'd have the ability to overcome mm -hmm. the distractions. Right. That <laughs> really good point. Yeah. Really good point. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and again, you, you you well, let me let me just ask you as an aside, and then we will, I promise, talk about That's your okay. current book. Um, but as an aside, did you write at that time longhand? Did you write with a keyboard of some sort? How did how, how did that happen? Well, I still have boxes of journals that I wrote in, but at that time, I remember got um, I got um, money like professional development funds, and I bought a laptop. And I can't wow. believe this. This is 1989, and I got this NEC, this Japanese laptop company, and it was a laptop, and all of the keys were in Japanese. Yeah. Like, like I don't even know how I learned to type on it. I honestly don't. It was amazing. But it was my first wow. own computer, my first laptop. And um, I think it even had like a printer in it that it used this special vellum paper. Mm -hmm. And um, so I did, I did write on that. that. Like to dive from the, you know, the what had been the case forever up until that point, yeah. you know, writing, writers wrote right. literally in yeah, longhand. And then typewriters, and yeah. And then typewriters, right? Yeah. And then finally to get to this kind of computer, laptop, keyboard phase. Yeah. But then to add in the complication <laughs> of Japanese, you know, keyboard and the Japanese language already is, yeah. is completely unconnectable to, yeah. to yeah. English. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Congratulations, man. You yeah. <laughs> you went through the fire there for, I did. for a while, I did. but clearly it, it paid off. Yeah. I know, and we won't talk uh, much about it because I do want to focus on your current book, but I know this is not the first book. It's your first novel, but you did also write a memoir several years ago. That process compared to this one, how, 
you, you, you've just described how this one kind of flowed when it, right. once it happened. Yeah. Was that the case with your memoir as well? No, not at all. No, it was a very painful process, in mm -hmm. fact. Um, right after my mom died, um, it was a very difficult time for me, and I was trying to f sort some things out, including um, the fact that I was, had been very disconnected from her. Mm. And, um, but really that time um, allowed me to focus and um, focus my writing on the experience of looking back over my life and really considering who I was in my family, my relationship to my mother. My dad died when I was in college and what that meant. And soon the material just started to <laughs> coalesce into, into a, a narrative. Mm -hmm. At the same time that um, my mom was sick, I was actually on a treasure hunt in New York City. I was looking for $10,000 in gold coins that were buried in New York City. It was That's something called- That's not an urban myth? It's not that? an urban myth, but it's, um, it's called an armchair treasure hunt. Somebody buries a treasure oh, and okay. then they set it up with clues and you have to figure wow. these very complex clues. Um, and once you figure out where they are, you actually go and you dig up the treasure. So the search for actual gold and the search for my connection to my parents um, the metaphorical search mm -hmm. um, came together as two storylines in a memoir that I called Trove, A Woman's Search for Truth and Buried Treasure. Mm -hmm. And um, after I finished it, I found a wonderful press out um, in Long Beach, California, Brown Paper Press, and they loved the book. And they did a wonderful job publishing. It was a great first experience. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, good for you. I mean, you. Uh, but again, I was asking in part because I don't want anybody to get the impression that Oh, you just sit down and the, everything just flows, right? No, I mean, not there's at all. so this was many seven different writers, right? There's so many yeah. different experiences that yeah. a writer, the same writer, will have in writing different books, right? Yeah, and with memoir, the difference is you, um, well, not for everybody, but from personal experience, with memoir, you're taking a lot of the pain and some of the most emotionally challenging situations in your life and as you try to put them on the page, you have to remember them with the specificity mm. of detail that you re-traumatize yourself. Mm. So I've talked to a lot of memoir writers and I teach memoir writing and I always warn them, like you have to be kind to yourself because when you're writing memoir, um, for example, there's a scene in my memoir about my dad, the day my dad died. And how many times did I have to recount that to get the details correct on the page? And it would leave me in tears every oh, yeah. time I actually had to go through that scene again over and over hundreds of times if you're writing a book. So the problem with memoir, the challenge with memoir, not the problem, is that you're, you're dealing with some very emotional um, um, sort of, <laughs> it can make you very um, right, right. volatile, it's, sensitive, mm -hmm. and with a novel it's, it's slightly fraught, different. right? It's very, it's very fraught, every, yeah. every and, and as you say, it's the specificity yeah. that means that you need to return to it yeah. in order to get it right. And yeah. then each time you do, you are, it's another, yeah. another yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. But the gift of memoir too, is that you can, um, you've taken something that might have been um, not a great experience mm -hmm. in your life mm -hmm. and you turned it into art. Mm -hmm. It becomes yeah. something beautiful or meaningful. You've, you've made art out of the mess. And that is, that Donna is Tart a really... Donna Tartt would certainly <laughs> agree, and, and many, many other writers. Absolutely, um, yeah. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you're, you're absolutely right about that. I could continue on, in that vein for a long time. I'm going to stop so that we can focus on Wednesdays at 1. So tell us what kind of novel this is um, and how it is that you, that this came to be. You said it was seeded a long time ago, mm -hmm. but just tell us a little bit genre. Okay. Uh, you can describe the novel to whatever degree you, you, you'd like. But. Okay, sure. So it's a literary suspense, and it's the story of a clinical psychologist, Gregory Weber, who's burdened by the guilt of this horrific thing he did as a teenager, a mistake he made that no one else knows about and no one else who's alive knows mm. about. And so he lives this very enviable life in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and he um, outwardly enviable, but inside he's tormented. And um, then one Wednesday at one, this woman appears in his therapy office 
and unscheduled client, and she seems to know things about his past and has this very uncanny knowledge of, mm. of what happened to Gregory when he was 17 and the situation. And so he becomes really obsessed with figuring out who this woman named Mira is and why she knows these things. And soon um, the roles reverse and he falls into the client role and she becomes the therapist. And so, so the central question of the novel is who is Mira and how is she connected to Gregory? Wow, and so. obviously we will find out by the time oh. we get to the last page, but <laughs> not will. until then, <laughs> no. <laughs> or approximately. Um, that sounds, I mean, it sounds, it sounds, it's got me hooked. I, I will say that. Um, and uh, I do, I was telling you before uh, we started uh, taping that I, this is a genre that I just, I just love. Um, and so I'm so very glad to know that there's another, piece of delight waiting for me in the future. Um, yeah. But tell me again, well, I guess one thing I would like to know is, you said that it, it was, it, it kind of gestated for a long time, right? Mm. Was that really around about the fact that, as you said before, as a, as a, as a, as a parent raising children in your house and, mm -hmm. you know, doing all of the it's a very labor intensive enterprise mm -hmm. to raise children. Um, was that what, what, what meant that it couldn't move forward um, from wherever it was seated? Um, or did something else have to happen besides the pandemic actually opening the opportunity in the way that you said? Did more, mm. did more have to happen for you perhaps? I, I, think, I think more had to happen. I think that mm. um, the story came to me the idea came to me when my um, husband and I were first together before we were married and he's a psychologist and a woman started stalking him, listening to our conversations outside our window and then mm. bringing them into therapy. And I wasn't interested in telling that story. That no, was too close to home and it became our personal nightmare. But the story that seeded in, as I said, was this idea of what if a therapist who's in control in the therapy role and usually the client is vulnerable. Mm -hmm. What if one day a client comes in and knows things about the therapist that she shouldn't know, something about his past? I didn't even know what she knew in my, in right. my head 28 right. years ago when I got this idea, but I just liked the role reversal that interested me. So I kind of had that idea. I tried to work with it in various ways and I tried to put it into a script. I tried kind of briefly with another novel that just didn't work. It was told from the client's point of view, mm -hmm. the woman's point of view. Mm -hmm. And in this case, during the quiet of the pandemic, when I had that space, 28 years of gestating, Gregory's voice came okay. to me. And then I had my entrance into this novel as I was telling it from the therapist's point of view. And uh then the novel made sense to me. And it opened to me in a way that it had never before. So is Gregory indeed, in fact, the the narrator? Of he's the novel? yeah. He's it's third person point of view, oh, but is. it's through but it is through, through Gregory. filtered through it, his consciousness. Yeah, right. exactly. So that's, it's yeah, yeah. That's very cool. So, um, you describe a process which I'm sure any writers out there are like, oh please, you know, I want what she had, right? Uh, kind of thing, which is it it can't. It, you, you sat down, thousand words each day. Next day, mm -hmm. there they were. Next day, there they were. Yeah. I mean, that must have been a wonder in and of itself for you. Yeah. Um, but you also mentioned three years later, you are now, you know, on the on the cusp of having this published. Yeah. Well, if you had the novel uh -huh. and it, you felt good about it and you felt like it was yeah. complete, tell us about what happens after that. That okay. means that you're wait, you know, that you're yeah. three years later and yeah. and you're just about to get the payoff. Yeah, sure. I think I'm actually probably on the shorter timeline for traditional publishing. I, um, I, took the, I finished the novel, summer 2020. I showed it to my beta readers, some friends that we always exchange our work with. And then um, I did a rewrite on it. I tightened it. I got it ready to send to agents. And then I saw that um, a woman named Zibby Owens of Zibby Books, um, she's a New York publisher. She, was, um, she had done a podcast called Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. And Trove, she had my memoir on her podcast and she featured it and she really loved the memoir. So I 
she started a publishing house in um, the fall of 2021. And I thought, I want to be with her. She was trying to do it differently, really create a community of writers and um, a really supportive publishing community mm -hmm. and, and traditional publishing. So with traditional royalties and right. advances. So wow. um, that's a good. It was a fantastic situation. And I sent the book to her, the manuscript to her. And um, she took it instantly. She loved it. And so she put it on her um, she put it into you know her calendar, her publishing calendar, and that was probably two years later. Mm. And so now, so now about oh, a year I and see. half. So, so from that point forward, yeah. things have gone relatively smoothly. Very and smoothly, quickly. yeah, very, very so, quickly. Okay, yeah, yeah. So it's just, I mean, again, for aspiring writers out there, or for people who are trying to calibrate their expectations appropriately, yeah. or something like that. Yeah. From the point at which you feel, and again, you've had readers mm -hmm. uh, who you trust. Um, also give you their feedback, et cetera. At the point that you feel like you have a finished work. Yeah. Um, you know, what should people, like what, 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 what advice, what lessons, what, what, what should people be kind of aware of, prepared for, et cetera, at that? So if you want to take it through the traditional publishing route, you just be prepared for some bumps. Mm. And um, I now have an agent, but it's very challenging to get an agent. A mm. lot of people are writing, a lot of good writers out there. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of access to writing information and to writing classes, of course, on the internet. So I would say to people, um, keep your expectations um, in line and work your butt off. Um, and if you want a traditionally published novel and you want to hold that book in your hands or pull it off the shelves of any of our bookstores, mm -hmm. then you are really going to have to commit to that project. And if you commit to the project and hold on to the idea that, that you want this um, and those two work in tandem, mm -hmm. the hard work and the belief, you can make it happen. You can make it happen. But Call in all your sources, yes. work hard, get feedback, get beta readers, don't get discouraged by the rejections. If you, you might get 100 rejections from an agent. That is not unusual mm -hmm. for people and from agents. And then who knows, wow. 101 could be your agent. I've heard this story so many times. So, so you I just have to be strapped in and yeah, ready to just kind of yeah. keep swimming yeah. against that tide. Be tenacious. Until, if yeah. you want it, um, there are a lot of artists out there. There are a lot of people with books, but what's going to make you set you apart is that you're going to you're not going to quit until you're holding your book in your hands i was a little like that 25 years later i haven't given up that's that yeah that's a good <laughs> testament right there okay um you know time's flown always does uh let me ask you one last question which is okay accomplishment major accomplishment right here um enjoy it etc is there going to be another one there is, is that <laughs> of right? course. Yeah, I'm working okay. on it. I'm not quite having the thousand word a day success as I did with this one, but I'm also distracted because I have a big launch to prepare for right. and right. a lot a book tour. And so He's it's not raising uh, kids took a lot. I'm not time raising to energy, I'm not but, raising kids, but, but I'm going on book exactly. tours. So so it's finally kind of my career time, um, full blast. So so, but I'm still working on another another project that's yeah. great well we will have you in with that one when the time comes thank you uh, i hope we so will hope it's not another three years but who <laughs> knows um i have been speaking with a our local author sandra a miller about uh i said i said sandra and i meant sandra um about her novel wednesdays at one and um it has been a delight it's thank been you such so a pleasure. much for coming Thanks, in james really appreciate it um i thank sandra for her time and you as well for yours. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm James Milan. This is Talk of the Town. We'll see you next time.